Hello and welcome to Cabrera and Aquarium's Discovery Lecture Series. I am Dr. Julianne Passarelli, the Education and Collections Curator at Cabrera and Aquarium. Cabrera and Aquarium is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks, and we are extremely grateful for the city's support. I would also like to thank the Aquarium Director, Chrislyn McCarran, and the Programs Director, Jim DePompe, for their support, and a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. I am happy to report that the aquarium is now open. After being closed for 15 months, we are super happy to be able to welcome you all back. Our hours of operation are Wednesday through Sunday from 12 to 5 p.m. We have some upcoming programs I would like to share with you. We are now resuming our monthly beach cleanups on the first Saturday of every month. The next one is tomorrow, August 7th at 9 a.m. We also have a salt marsh open house coming up the following Saturday on August 14th at 10 a.m. And our little sports class for the for two to four year olds starts next week. For more details, you can visit our website at kabroomandaquarium.org. Before we get started, I, was all, I would also like to thank and acknowledge the friends of Kabroom and Aquarium for their support. We would also like to thank all the members of the aquarium for their support. Being a member is a great way to support our aquarium while receiving special members only benefits. Your friends membership helps support the aquarium's quality education, research and outreach programs provided to nearly 150,000 school children each year. If you would like to become a member, visit our website for details or stop by the aquarium's welcome booth. For now, we plan to continue our lecture series online the upcoming lecture is Friday, October 1st, 2021. And our speaker is Dr. Giannis Papastamatiu from Florida International University. Yanni is an ichthyologist that runs the Predator Ecology and Conservation Lab at FIU. And he specializes on the ecology, biology, and behavior of sharks, rays, and predatory bony fish. I hope you can join us for this online lecture. After that, the next lecture will be on Friday, December 3rd, and the speaker is still yet to be confirmed. We are hoping the December lecture will be back in person at the aquarium. The upcoming schedule and speakers for the 2021 year will be posted on our website. There is a link on the homepage under new splash called Discovery Lecture Series, and that will take you to the upcoming schedule. If you missed any lectures, they are all recorded and archived on our website. On the Discovery Lecture Series page, just scroll down to Lecture Archives 2014 to 2021, or go to the CMA YouTube page. If you are interested in the upcoming lectures, please RSVP to receive the webinar link like you did tonight. But again, for now, the upcoming October lecture will be online, and hopefully December, we will be back in person. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Edie Witter. Dr. Witter is CEO and senior scientist at the Ocean Research and Conservation Association, a not-for-profit she helped found in 2005 to help save the ocean she has spent most of her career exploring. She is a deep sea explorer, oceanographer, and marine biologist, and has made hundreds of deep sea submersible dives into the dark ocean. She was the first to capture video recordings of bioluminescent animals and the first to film the giant squid in its natural habitat. Most recently, she has published a book called Below the Edge of Darkness, a memoir of exploring light and life in the deep sea. The title of tonight's talk is Here Be Monsters, Exploring the Edge of the Map. Thank you, and we welcome Dr. Edie Witter. It's a pleasure to be here, albeit virtually. Um, but I get to talk about my favorite thing. And then even though we're going to be way past my bedtime, I get to crawl into bed right away because I'm home. So um, this is going to be a talk about exploration, um, why we explore, what we have left to explore, why it's so important that we be exploring now more than ever, and why I think we need explorers now more than at any time in human history. Now, it used to be that uh, map makers would draw monsters at the edge of the map 
to warn off explorers that were foolish enough to wander into uncharted territory. But instead of scaring people away, it seemed to do just the opposite because it is in our nature to explore the world around us. We are all explorers. From the very first time a baby crawls away from the safety of its mother's arms to see what's around that corner, often filled with joy and wonder at what they discover, they are satisfying that innate human need to explore. It is how we determined what food is safe to eat, what, where it was safe to live, what animals were dangerous, um, what animals could act as food. And in modern times, that desire to explore has led to fantastic innovations and remarkable discoveries. So how is it possible that we have explored so little of our own planet? Although sometimes the excuse for space exploration is we've explored everything here on earth, now we have to turn to space to satisfy our need to explore, but nothing could be further from the truth. We've explored such a tiny amount of our own planet. The number that you hear most often is we've only explored 5% of the ocean, but actually that number is not right, no matter how you look at it. Um, if you're talking about mapping the ocean, as with uh, multi-beam sonar, then we're coming up on maybe being close to 30% we've mapped of the bottom of the ocean this way. But I wouldn't call that exploring because you're not even entering the environment. If you're talking about actually going and visiting a place to explore it, which is how I think you would, should be thinking about exploration, um, then we've only visited about 0.05% of the ocean floor. That would be the equivalent of exploring three city blocks of the entire island of Manhattan, and then only at ground level. The ocean is on average 2.3 miles deep. That's like almost 10 Empire State Buildings. So there's also this enormous, enormous volume above that bottom that also hasn't been explored. When we're talking about the living space on our planet, what's known as the biosphere, the ocean represents more than 99.5% of the biosphere. You get a real sense of what an ocean planet is if you look at it from the Pacific side and you realize just how much ocean we're talking about. And every drop of that ocean is filled with life. This is the machinery of life on our planet, and we need to explore it to understand it in order to better protect it. Now, we're not doing a very good job of this, and it's my obligation as a scientist to share with you some of the bad stuff that's happening, but I'm gonna promise you, I'm gonna make this quick because it's, it's kind of hard to take, but we do need to be aware of what's going on. First of all, we're warming the planet, which means we're warming the ocean. And that has all kinds of alarming implications. One of which is to change the patterns of the rivers in the ocean, what's known as the thermohaline circulation pattern. This is like the Gulf Stream and it carries heat all around the planet. And it's been stable for 10,000 years and that has been what has allowed us to have agriculture. But we have evidence now that some of these circulation patterns are breaking down because of the climate change. And if we lost that stability, agriculture would become very, very difficult. <clears throat> the carbon that we're putting in the air that is leading to the warming of the planet is also acidifying the ocean. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, So that squiggly green line is the carbon dioxide going into the ocean. Um, and the consequent blue line is the drop in pH. We're actually acidifying the ocean, which we're talking about a volume of 300 million cubic miles. That is a staggering volume to think that we've managed to change its chemistry to the point now that it's becoming difficult for coral reefs to form their skeletons and sea butterflies like you see here to make their shells. These little guys are an important part of the base of the food web. Um, so it has major implications. We're also filling the ocean with our 
plastics and our pollution and our toxins, our trash um, to horrific effect. Uh, bottom trawling is one that alarms me no end because I've seen the consequences of it. These nets are dragged across the bottom of the ocean with these rollers in front of them to cause the bottom fish and bottom shrimp to jump up into the net. But what they do is they take an exquisite undersea garden like you see on the left and turn it into a moonscape like you see on the right. And so some of those gardens with corals, you know, seven to eight feet tall sometimes, um, have taken a thousand or more years to grow. And for one haul of shrimp, they won't sustain life for hundreds of years. All of this going on out of sight, out of mind. Same with deep water drilling for oil and the pollutants that that's putting into the water. And now we've got a new alarming situation with um, the gold, what's called the global gold rush, where we are poised on the beginning of a big effort uh, with seafloor mining to get the heavy metals that are needed for the batteries that run our cell phones and our computers, the silver, gold, copper, manganese, cobalt, nickel, and zinc, um, there's gonna be a gold rush. And the damage it's gonna do, once again, is gonna be out of sight and out of mind. But we're having this impact everywhere we look. These hockey stick curves, as they're called, all follow human population with CO2 concentration and water usage and species extinctions and the number of motor cars on the planet, fisheries exploited, ozone depletion. It's um, an endless chain of misery. Okay, that was the Band-Aid, it's been ripped off. So why aren't we doing more about it? There's two theories about the psychology of this. One is the boiling frog theory syndrome, with the idea being that if you drop a frog into boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you heat it slowly, it'll stay until it's stewed. Now, personally, I'd like to think frogs are smarter than that. And I certainly want to believe that humans are. The other is the idea that has been put forth by a number of people. It's been said that Martin Luther King did not mobilize the civil rights movement by preaching, I have a nightmare. But that's what the environmental community keeps doing and wondering why nobody wants to listen to us. People have, are so alarmed by what we're saying that they just want to cover their eyes and ears and try to pretend it's not happening. However, I think what we need to be doing instead of beating the, the drum, and I, as you saw, I just beat the drum. It, we do need to know what's happening and share it with the world. But I think it would be better if we focus on our strengths rather than our weaknesses. And our strength has always been exploration. It has always, always been the key to our survival. And I believe that we need it now more than ever because of that. Explorers are by nature optimists. They have to be. And they have to be able to figure out solutions to problems to be able to go forward. So I want to make the case for exploration tonight, why we do it, how we do it, and why it's so thrilling to do it that more people ought to be trying to jump on the bag bandwagon. So how do we explore? Well, the primary way we know about life in the ocean is we drag nets behind ships like this one. This little 110 foot vessel, the Bolero, was actually the first ship I ever went to sea on. And we were out there dragging nets behind the ship, which is the primary way, as I said, that we know about life in the ocean. And I defy you to name any other branch of science that still depends on thousand year old technology. But that's what we do. And amongst biologists, we have a joke that nets only capture the slow, the stupid and the greedy. It's only catching the animals that aren't fast enough to outrun it, the, the ones that aren't smart enough to outrun it or the ones that try to grab food out of it in, in their greed and end up getting caught in it. But what about the ones that are wily enough to get away? How would we ever know that they're even there? It's incredible that this is our primary tool for ocean exploration still to this day. We bring the animals up into our world where we're comfortable, but unfortunately they're not. Um, they come up mostly dead. Usually be, that's more because of the temperature change than the pressure change. 
Um, and it shows us nothing about anything to do with their behaviors or the, their um, complexity of their lives in the deep sea. The other way that we explore is we go down with submersibles or remote operated vehicles. That's done much less frequently than, than net hauling. Um, and the trouble with these platforms is they use bright white lights, <clears throat> which are blinding to most of these deep sea animals and thrusters that can be extremely noisy and scare the animals away. So I'm trying to decide whether I wanna share with you. I, I'm gonna to try to sh share what this sounds like. Um, so let me see if you can hear this. So this is what the Johnson ceiling submersible sounds like. It's, it's an electric with hydraulic capabilities, but it's actually very quiet. And using this submersible, I always felt like I saw a lot more animals from it than I ever saw from the ROVs. The ROVs that I was fortunate enough to be able to use were with uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute where I was an adjunct. The Tiburon is on electric with hydraulic capabilities. And I, I think you can probably hear that more clearly. But the thing that's used most often for ROVs, especially deep diving ROVs, is hydraulics because um, oops, they have um, the power that's needed. But this is what hydraulics sound like underwater. No? Well, that figures. Hang on, one more try. If you're a scuba diver and ever been in the water when hydraulics are running, you know just how deafening it could be. Clearly, these platforms must be scaring animals away. So um, how are we ever to learn about life in the ocean if this is how we explore? Now, a case in point for this would be the famous kraken, the giant squid, a creature so enormous that it was said that it could be mistaken for an island when seen floating at the surface and had a reputation as a killer that we could drag men and their ships um, to watery graves. For a long time, scientists questioned the real validity of this animal, especially because they, these were sailors' tales that often, the animal often grew in the telling of the tale. But then in 1861, a French warship working in, off the uh, Canary Islands came across one floating at the surface and uh, they managed to get a rope around it. Um, actually, they fired a cannon at it first to make sure it was dead. Um, got a rope around it. The rope actually cut through the body and the head and tentacles and arms dropped away, but they managed to bring the tail back. But it was enough to convince the scientists back on shore that this was an, a real thing and it really was a monster in size anyway. Um, and so it was written up um, for the French Academy of Scientists. And uh, one of the people that read that report was Jules Verne, who was writing his science fiction novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which got published in 1870. <clears throat> and um, that account went a long way to establishing the giant squid as uh, uh, a monster to be uh, a terror of the sea. After that, more scientists began to be able to study these animals because of specimens that came ashore, died, floated to the surface and, and drifted ashore. And there were specimens that then were collected and studied. And it became kind of the holy grail of natural history cinematography to be able to capture one of these amazing creatures in its natural habitat on film. And so there were a number of expeditions put together over the years, um, including this uh, in, to New Zealand in 1997 and 1999, which was an international effort um, to try to film the giant squid in its natural habitat. And um, all of these efforts failed. Um, and uh, I would maintain because they were scaring the squid away. So I was, wasn't a giant squid hunter. Uh, my interest was in bioluminescence. I had done my PhD on the bioluminescence of a dinoflagellate um, and was actually interested in just the electrophysiology of it, but got more and more interested in 
animals that make light. And then I got an opportunity to make a series of dives in this diving suit called WASP. It's not um, an acronym. It's just somebody thought it looked like the insect with the yellow body and the bulbous head and the pincers for arms. It was developed by the offshore oil industry for diving on oil rigs down to 2000 feet. And I got to be included with a group of scientists that were testing it as a tool for exploring this largest unexplored volume of the ocean, the midwater. I like to tell people that diving in WASP completely changed my understanding of the nature of life in the ocean. It also changed my understanding of the expression colder than a witch's tit, because that's a metal suit and the deep sea is very cold. You note the wool cap and the gloves and the wool sweater, they help. But I'd come up from a five hour dive with my teeth chattering and my lips blue. And the old oil rig diver that was in charge of these dives, Charlie, finally took pity on me and he pulled me aside. He put his arm around my shoulder and he said, look, I'll let you know a little secret, but you got to promise not to tell any of these other guys. I said, sure, Charlie, what is it? Pantyhose, which I guess is sort of like silk underwear, but I was never sure which kept me warmer, the pantyhose or the vision in my mind of Charlie wearing pantyhose. Anyways, my first dive in WASP, I got trained in a tank in Port Wainimi but my first open ocean dive was in Santa Barbara Channel. I went down to 800 feet and I turned out the lights and I turned out the lights because I knew I would see bioluminescence, but I was just totally unprepared for how much there was. It was magnificent. It was like being under a desert sky at night, except all the stars were swirling around me. It was breathtaking and also mystifying because I knew at this point in my career how much energy it takes for living creatures to produce light. And I felt like this had to be one of the most important processes in the ocean. I couldn't understand why more people weren't studying it. And so I've been studying it ever since. So if people are familiar with bioluminescence at all, it's usually these guys, fireflies. And there are a few other land animals that can make light. There's earthworms and millipedes and centipedes, some fungi. but in general, it's pretty rare on land. In the ocean, it's the rule rather than the exception. If you drag a net from a thousand meters to the surface in almost any ocean of the world, most of the animals you bring up in that net will be bioluminescent. And in fact, most of the time it's anywhere from 75% to as much as 90% of the animals make light. And they do it for a whole variety of reasons and with magnificent displays like the ones that you see here. So I'm just gonna cover just a few of the examples of how animals use bioluminescence. A lot of them use it to help them find food in the darkness. They have built-in flashlights like this fish, which has one right behind the eye. That particular headlight can roll back into the head just like the headlights on your Lamborghini um, when they're not in use. Um, it's not because it's bacterial luminescence. This fish actually produces its own bioluminescent chemistry. Light from living animals is the result of chemicals being mixed together. The chemicals are called luciferin and luciferase, um, but it's actually, those are just generic terms. It's different chemicals in different animals. Uh, and most of them make their own chemicals, but a, a significant proportion um, also use symbionts. This one is making its own light, as does this one. This is a, a lantern fish that uses high beams. It's got headlights at the, in front of the eye there. And then this is one of my favorites, the viper fish. It's got a luminescent lure on the end of this very long dorsal fin ray that sticks out of the top of its head. Um, and that dangles in front of the toothy jaw that gives the angler fish its name. Those teeth are so long that if they enclosed inside the mouth of the fish, it would actually impale its own brain. Instead, the teeth slide in grooves on the outside of the head, and if it closed its mouth, the teeth would actually extend above the eye that you see there. And then there's a light organ in every single scale. There's light organs in this mucus layer on the belly and on the back. There's light organs in the fins. There's these beautiful, beautiful jewel-like light organs on the belly and that extend into the mouth that I've seen these flash and it makes these translucent teeth almost look like they're flashing. 
and there's a flashlight under the eye. It's just covered with light producing capability. Thanks to Finding Nemo, people know about anglerfish and the luminescent lure that it can use as an attractant. Although given Pixar's budget, I really wish that they'd spent just a tiny bit more money and maybe played it, paid a graduate student that could have been a consultant and told them that those are the eyes of an animal that's been preserved in formalin. These are the eyes of a living anglerfish. And she's got this fishing rod that sticks out of the top of her head with a luminescent lure. And this is a, a special light organ that contains bioluminescent bacteria. So she provides the bacteria with a growth chamber and growth medium, and they provide her with light that she uses as a lure for her living mousetrap. She sticks this out over this incredible maw of hers in order to be able to snap up unsuspecting little animals that come and are attracted to the light. This lovely lady has a very elaborate lure. She's got kind of a tulip shaped lure with all these amazing translucent threads sticking out of it. And the different shapes of lures may be to attract different kinds of prey, but they also serve to help males recognize females of their own species. Because the males in the anglerfish world are what are known as dwarf males. This little guy has no visible means of self-support. He has no lure for attracting food and no big teeth for clamping onto it. His only hope for existence on the planet is as a gigolo. He's got to find himself a babe and then he's got to hang on for life. So this little guy has found himself this babe and he sealed the relationship with an eternal kiss. His flesh fuses with her flesh, her bloodstream grows into his body and he becomes nothing more than a little sperm sack. This is definitely a matriarchal society. She does not even have to be monogamous. This is a different species of anglerfish. She's transparent and she's got two males attached. Um, and I think the record is eight males attached because some women are greedy. Um, and the fact of her being transparent is interesting because that is another defense mechanism that some animals use for living in a world where there's no place to hide one thing you could do is to be transparent. There's no trees or bushes to hide behind out here. Um, and that creates a problem though, if you're a larger complex animal um, that can't be transparent because you cast a very distinctive shadow that makes you easy prey for, that predators are swimming below you. And so as a consequence of this, an enormous number of animals um, hide in the dark depths during the day and only come up to feed in food rich surface waters under the cover of darkness. So this is what's known as vertical migration. And it's the most massive animal migration pattern on the planet. It occur occurs in oceans all around the world every single day where as the sun comes up, the animals dive into the depths to hide in the darkness. And then as the sun sets, they hurry to the surface to where photosynthesis occurred and where there is food that they can eat. And um, it's an astonishing adaptation that results in most of these animals living their lives below the edge of darkness, which is why so many animals in the ocean have evolved this capability of making light to compensate for living in darkness. How do you survive in the dark? You make your own light. So, to save yourself from having to swim all the way down in the darkest, deepest depths, it's helpful if you can camouflage yourself a little bit from predators like this one. Note this, this is a hatchet fish that's got an upward pointed eye and an upward pointed mouth, looking for some silhouette above it that means a meal. But at the same time he's doing that, there could be something bigger below him doing exactly the same thing. So he's camouflaged by having silver sides and a narrow silhouette that makes him harder to see from below. But taking that one step further, if you look at the belly of this fish, it's got light organs. Now, those don't produce pink light, as I've seen suggested in some books. Those are filters that just narrow the spectrum of the blue light that's coming out. So it's a perfect match to downwelling sunlight. And if a cloud goes over the sun and dims it, the sunlight, 
the fish dims its bioluminescence. So it's an absolutely perfect match. And you may think, well, the spots aren't good camouflage compared to a background of, of dim blue light above. But most of the deep sea animals have very light sensitive eyes that where they have given up resolution for sensitivity. So they have pretty blurry vision, in other words, which means that those spots blur together and disappear and just become perfect camouflage. And this is what's known as counter illumination. And it's really, really common in the open ocean environment. In fact, this little fish, which is called the bent tooth bristlemouth and is bioluminescent because it has this camouflage trick of counter illumination. This little fish is the most common vertebrate on the planet. The most common animal with a backbone is a bioluminescent creature. Krill, so abundant in the ocean that they can serve as a food source for baleen whales. All krill are bioluminescent except for one um, fairly rare benthic species because biology requires an exception to every rule. Um, and it's got light organs that, it point, that are pointed straight down. And in fact, when this shrimp swims up or down, it tilts its body. And so those light organs actually rotate um, so that they're always pointing straight down. And once again, if a cloud goes over the sun and dims the sunlight, it dims its light accordingly. Even squid use this trick. Um, this is a squid I caught off um, the Bahamas with the Johnson Sealing submersible. And it can actually change the color of its bioluminescence, which you're not going to see here. Um, but uh, if it's down deep during the day, it produces a pure blue bioluminescence. But if it's up near the surface at night, counter illuminating against moonlight, it can turn on another set of photophores that are greenish. So it becomes blue green and a better match to the downwelling moonlight. Animals also use their bioluminescence for defense. A lot of them can release their bioluminescent chemicals, their luciferin and luciferase into the water just the way the shrimp spews light out of its mouth like a fire breathing dragon in order to temporarily blind this viper fish and so it can escape into the darkness. There's even fish that use this trick. This fish is called uh, the shining tube shoulder because it actually does have a tube on its shoulder that squirts out light. Um, and actually I was uh, one of the scientists on the first blue planet um, and we captured this fish and this is me in the lab about to touch that tube on its shoulder and you just get to see what an astonishing amount of light it puts out. But it's even more astonishing because it isn't just luciferin and luciferase, it's actually whole cells which is very unusual. Most animals don't do that because it's energetically so costly. We have no idea why this fish does that, but it's one of those wonderful mysteries um, of which there are so many in the ocean that um, I would just love to be able to figure out. And then there are animals like this jellyfish that have something that's called a bioluminescent burglar alarm. It's so weird to think about the, this elaborate light display that this jellyfish produces. It's a pinwheel of light that swirls around the bell. And, and why would a jellyfish, which doesn't even have eyes, produce such an elaborate light display? Well, the idea behind a burglar alarm is that on, on your car, the beeping horn and flashing lights are meant to attract attention, hopefully of the police that'll take the burglar away but it will scare the burglar away because it doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be seen. So you've got a jellyfish minding its own business in the deep. And yes, being red is, is unobtrusive because when there's only blue light, being red is just as good as being black. Um, and then something comes along and starts munching on it. Well, now the jellyfish just lights up like all get out and in so doing illuminates its predator, making it visible to its predators and thereby possibly removing the threat. So that's the concept behind a bioluminescent burglar alarm. Um, but nobody had ever actually seen it in action. And you know, the question was, would it really work? So I wanted to test that. So I created an electronic jellyfish that is an imitation of um, the uh, display that I just showed you. So it's just a ring of blue LEDs um, embedded in epoxy. 
And if your eyes are good, you may be able to note um, just what a shoestring operation this was because you can still see the word Ziploc in the uh, mold that we used to make the electronic jellyfish. Okay, so I've got this imitation bioluminescence and now I wanna see how animals in the deep sea respond to it. But how do I do that? Because all, as I said, if we go down with submersibles or remote operated vehicles, we're using bright white lights. It's very scary. It's gonna scare the animals away. What I wanted was some unobtrusive way of observing. So I, I developed a camera system called the eye in the sea. And the idea was to be able to observe, on a, you leave it on the bottom and just let it sit there, but it needed to be able to see without being seen. Now we do that all the time to study nocturnal animals on land. Um, we use infrared cameras and infrared lights, but you can't do that in the ocean because infrared light is absorbed so quickly by seawater. So I was trying to play around with different types of red light to see if I could combine it with the intensified cameras that I was using for bioluminescence to be able to see without being seen. And I was struggling with this for some time and finally came up with a solution by imitating this fish. This is called a stoplight fish. And it's very unusual because not only does it have the typical blue flashlight on the side of its head, um, but it also has some red ones. And that's surprising because most things in the ocean only produce blue light and only see blue light because that's the color that travels furthest through seawater. This fish is unusual in that it produces red light and it can also see red light. So it can use it like a sniper scope to be able to sneak up on animals that are blind to red light and see without being seen. It could also use that red light as kind of a secret wave band for communicating with a mate and um, not risk drawing the attention of a predator. So um, the first time I got to test this system with its new illumination um, that used a filter like that, that the flashlight fish uses in order to cut out all the shorter wavelengths um, was in the Gulf of Mexico in 2004. And I put the camera system down using the Johnson C-Link and set it on the bottom and just left it there. And uh, then I collected it a day later and I had programmed it for the first four hours to just sit there quietly with its red lights on. And I don't know if you can see this, um, it's, it's, it wasn't a very um, good camera at the time. And, uh, but I was thrilled by this video because what you're seeing there, if you look closely is at the bottom right hand corner there's a fish swimming directly towards the camera. And I could tell from observing the various recordings that we made that these fish were completely undisturbed. There, were, there was no reaction to my lights. They would swim directly into the lights and not see them. Um, so that was fantastic. Then four hours into the deployment, I had programmed the electronic jellyfish to come on for the very first time. 86 seconds after it came on for the very first time, we recorded this. This is a squid over six feet long that is so new to science, it could not be placed in any known scientific family. Up until this point, I'd been having a really hard time getting funding agencies to fund this concept because they kept saying, well, what will you discover? And I kept saying, well, I don't know. I think we've been scaring things away. That's the point. Um, but once I got this footage, I went back to the National Science Foundation and I said, this is what we will discover. And they gave me a half a million dollars to do it right, which involved creating the world's first deep sea webcam, which uh, was installed in Monterey Canyon. And you're seeing it here being plugged in for the very first time. And to me, this was way more th thrilling than any spacewalk. So they had installed this power bar basically on the bottom of the Monterey Canyon, almost 3000 feet deep, um, so there's a cable running from offshore and these underwater plugs that could be plugged in so you could run different experiments using the same power source. And we had about um, 50 meters of cable running from the power bar to where we had the, eye in the, the new version of the eye in the sea, this moored version of the eye in the sea sitting. And so it sat on the bottom for eight months and as I said, it was actually the world's first deep sea webcam because we had the data going to the web. 
Um, and, you know, we had a lot of people that were watching it pretty re regularly because there was a lot of cool stuff happening. Um, and absolutely the best stuff that happened was when we would be testing the electronic jellyfish. There you can see the red lights. So the next three sequences are video recorded with this camera system um, at, when the electronic jellyfish was being activated with the pinwheel display. And this was the typical response. That was a juvenile Humboldt squid coming in and attacking and then not finding food, which is what they expect to find. They expect to find whatever's attacking the jellyfish. Um, and so they swim away in disgust. Um, this one comes in, same thing, and inks his disgust um, before going away. Um, but this next one is what I call the Einstein of squid because he right away recognized something wasn't right here. And he comes in and goes, mm, uh, that's not Rose away. And he thinks about it for a little while. And then he decides, well, maybe if I come at it from a different direction, uh, no. So it was on the basis of this data that I got invited on a television funded expedition um, off Japan. It was funded by the Jan Japan Broadcasting Corporation um, with uh, some funding from Discovery Channel. Uh, and it was, uh, as I said, off Japan in a place called the Ogasawara Islands. Um, this was a place where uh, Japanese scientist Tsunumi Kubadera had been studying for some time. He was a giant squid hunter, is a giant squid hunter. Um, and he had been going out there with still cameras for a long time, trying to get still images of a giant squid using this faded camera. And he finally did it. And it was on the basis of that, that um, NHK and Discovery were willing to fund this expedition. And that's Tsunimi Kubadera on the left. Steve O'Shea in the center is a New Zealand uh, giant squid hunter. And I was the odd one out because um, my idea was seemed kind of uh, crazy, I think, to most of these people, the idea of using the optical lure. Um, but I did manage to convince uh, Kubadera, um, if not O'Shea, to use the red lights. Um, so what I was doing was taking advantage of six weeks at sea, which was unheard of in those days, um, sub time uh, or ship time. And, uh, using the Medusa, this uh, new version of the eye in the sea that no longer required a submersible or remote operated vehicle to deploy it because it could just be thrown off the back of the ship. And so this is the new version of the electronic jellyfish, which was housed in a bento sphere. Um, and it had an intensified camera, which you see in this, uh, this pinwheel display um, that we were imitating with this ring of blue LEDs. And so once um, we were ready to pick it up, we track with the satellite beacon to where the buoy was, pull it out of the water, and then download the video and start going through it. Well, because it was a television program, they were filming everything all the time. So they managed to capture that amazing moment of discovery when we did it. We actually got the first images of a giant squid in its natural habitat. Oh my God. At the same time we were out there, we were also using a Triton submersible and going down, the three of us were alternating turns going down for eight hour dives, um, each of us using different approaches. But Kubadera's was closest to mine using the red light um, and he had a bait squid, which uh, he has an optical lure on that as well, which is a squid jig. Um, and he was convinced to use the red light. So this is a little hard to see initially. Um, but that's the bait squid with the squid jig flashing. And you're going to see the giant come in from behind, wrist turning on the white lights. And we all held our breath when that happened, when we saw it, the recording later, but it didn't run away. In fact, we recorded this squid for 26 minutes. And then we filmed one again in 2019, again with the Medusa, this time in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, working from a much smaller ship. Um, and a much smaller operation. This was not television funded. This was NOAA funded, uh, operating off the Point Sur, again with the Medusa, 
and um, this was my colleague on that trip, Nathan Robinson, and we were trading off looking at the downloaded video and Nathan came in um, to the mess where I was and his eyes were just about popping out of his head. And I followed him back in, looked over his shoulder and this is what I saw. This is the electronic jellyfish that you see in the foreground and that white bag <clears throat> um, has bait in it. And in the left-hand side of the screen there, you're seeing the giant tracking the e-jelly. So the Medusa is kind of bouncing up and down because there's a little wave action being transmitted down the line. And it's very clear <clears throat> that the giant squid is visually hunting, um, which was uh, really fascinating because there were quite a few scientists that believed it was a sit and wait predator. It is not, it is a visual hunter, which makes sense when you think of the size of that eye. And it came in and swept his arms across the bait bag found it wanting, this is not what it wanted, and it moved on. Um, but once we were convinced that what we had recorded was actually a giant squid, we did uh, an interview from the bridge of the Point Sur for the New York Times. And then unlike with the Discovery Channel production, which um, was embargoed until the documentary came out, this was released immediately. We shared the video on the NOAA website and it went viral around the world, covered by hundreds of um, outlets, CNN, USA Today, National Geographic. It was even covered by Out Magazine, which claimed that the G in LGBTQ stands for giant squid. Um, it was a huge, huge public response. And the, the beautiful thing about it was that it revealed this creature to be anything but a monster. I mean, it's almost just seems casual in the way it attacks here. And it doesn't seem like a monster at all. Like so many of the scary things that have frightened us as humans over time, once we study them, they're not nearly as frightening as we think they are. And so I think this is a lesson for us about what we need to be doing for our planet right now. And But it may mean making some kind of tough choices. Um, so we've not spent anywhere near the amount of money on ocean exploration that we've spent on space exploration. This is the disparity when the shuttle was uh, um, flying and uh, it was NASA was getting a budget of $3.8 billion a year compared to the NOAA ocean exploration budget of 23.7 million per year. Huge difference. Um, and if you calculate the cost of one space shuttle launch with a, um, pay, with a full payload, that's approximately a billion dollars. Um, and relate that to submersible diving. For the cost of one space shuttle launch, we could have been diving the Johnson C submersible twice a day for 110 years. So that's a huge disparity that goes a long way to explaining why we've explored so little of our deep ocean. Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. If we're going to adapt to the changes that are happening into our, in our world, then we need to explore that world around us so that we can learn how best to survive in it. Because as another one of my heroes said, the future is in the hands of those who explore. And I hope I've inspired a few ex new explorers in the audience tonight. And for those of you that would like to learn more about exploration or bioluminescence, um, I'd like to share with you my excitement in having my book just come out less than two weeks ago, Below the Edge of Darkness. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. And with that, I will close and gladly take some questions. Thank you, Edie, that was fantastic. I'm getting lots of texts from friends going, oh my God, this footage is amazing. That was so great, that was so great, thank you. Um, uh, we are so um, thankful and grateful that you uh, are staying up late <laughs> and giving um, this talk to us. Um, those of you that are watching, if you have any questions for Dr. Witter, please put them in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can. 
Um, there's a few already. Um, the, the, the comments are coming in, um, Edie, just so you know, in the chat, amazing, fantastic. Everyone's super, super um, excited about your talk. Oh, thank you. So um, let's see. Okay, there's a few here. Um, Dawn is asking, is there a way for a non-scientist uh, to go down into the ocean depths, kind of like how the billionaire boys are going into space and allowing civilians to tag along? <laughs> well, actually, uh, I think there is going to be, yes. It's, it's beginning to happen. So uh, submersibles um, are getting more and more impressive. Um, advances in material science and engineering are resulting in submersibles that are far less expensive um, than they used to be. So it's possible to, to purchase a submersible for one or $2 million now. And so wealthy people are getting submersibles that they have on their yachts. And you know, Triton has a three person submersible. I think they're developing a, a I can't remember whether it was a five or a seven person submersible. I actually expect the deep sea to become a tourist industry um, fairly, fairly soon. It's, it's just this whole thing about exploring the ocean um, is so strange because our typical pattern as humans is we explore something and then we exploit it. But we're actually exploiting the ocean before we've explored it. And that's why I think you know it's so important that we be exploring it now so people are aware of what's there so that they can, that people won't protect what they don't even know exists. I, you know, I want people going down there and seeing these fantastic deep sea gardens filled with bioluminescent corals and um, plankton and drifting squid and just amazing things that they, they should love and want to protect because it's part of the machinery of life on our planet. Yeah. Okay, Cindy has a question. Um, I am so concerned about deep sea mining for nodules. Will you speak a little more about this? Yeah, so it's she's talking about manganese nodules. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really, really concerned about it as well, which is why we need this higher level of awareness because once again, destruction is gonna go on out of sight and out of mind. They're just gonna rape the bottom of the ocean for these minerals that are just sitting there waiting to be plucked as far as they're concerned. Um, it's particularly alarming because some of the mining is, is uh, being targeted around um, deep sea vents, um, which you know have all kinds of amazing life forms that we know so little about. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, Lee has a question about, is the Monterey Bay Canyon the most ex um, explored area? Oh, that's a good question. I expect it probably is. And Bari's just done an amazing job of um, exploration and, and their focus on the Monterey Canyon has expanded our understanding of it, uh, that one patch of the ocean enormously. Yeah. Um, another question from Lee, would the Atolla lure also work for the colossal squid? Yes, we think it would. <laughs> Okay, um, Lauren wants to know, have you explored near the North Sea or the Arctic Circle? I have not. And now that I've lived in Florida all these years, I don't think I could. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Boston, but I've lost my antifreeze. I think I'd die in that climate. <laughs> I'm sure if you got an invitation, you would go. <laughs> I probably would. Yeah. Um, okay, someone anonymous. Um, wants to know what advice would you give to an early career marine science conservationist to become involved in your line of research? Well, I um, often tell uh, aspiring marine biologists to, for goodness sakes, don't just take marine biology courses. <laughs> Diversify. We're, we're going to need uh, some really innovative thinking and outside the box thinking. And so, you know, if you've got a talent that's outside the box, don't discard it, you know, maybe foster it and add it to your 
repertoire when you're thinking about going into marine biology. I know students that have just taken one marine biology course after another because they love it so much, which I understand, but it doesn't make them employable and it doesn't really make them all that useful for solving these really complex problems that we're facing. So, you know, find something else that you want to focus on, you know, um, side scan sonar, great, or ecotoxicity, great, or molecular biology. I mean, you know, diversify. Uh, Kelvin is asking, oh, if you could mention your book title again, please. Oh, happily. Thank you, Kelvin. <laughs> <laughs> Below the Edge of Darkness, a memoir about exploring the light and life in the deep ocean. Thank you. And um, I, uh, I'm reminded by a colleague of mine, Diane, that uh, Dr. Witter's book will be available in the Cabrillo Aquarium gift shop next week. <laughs> Oh, goody. And it, you can purchase it online um, on our website, or you can come by the gift shop and buy it in person. Okay, Shauna would like to know, what is the strangest thing you have witnessed in the deep sea that still remains a mystery today? It's called the flashback phenomenon. And it's only people until, well, it's only people that have gone in submersibles that are, are familiar with it. And it's only those that turn out the lights and flash the light outside the sub. So if you do that, and it doesn't happen everywhere or every time, but if you flash the lights on and it works much better if you do two or three flash pulses, everything all around you lights up and it all comes on together and then fades away. And it's, it's called the flashback phenomenon, but it's incredibly difficult to film because, you know, if you aim your camera out there, you're not going to be focused in the right place. It's, it's been very dim, but now we've got cameras that are getting more and more sensitive. Um, I have a hypothesis, which I actually talk about in the book, um, about what that phenomenon actually is. And it could be really important because I think it's part of the carbon pump. Um, it's telling us something about what's happening with carbon in the ocean. Uh, so there's, some, but that's just one of many very great mysteries to be solved. So cool. Okay, Alana um, writes, Dr. Witter, my son and I are huge fans and love the documentary Monster Squid, The Giant is Real. What are your exploration plans for the future? Well, uh, so in 2005, I started a not-for-profit called the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. And I actually thought I was giving up my deep sea exploration life to try to pay back the ocean I love. Um, so, you know, we work on uh, a lot of the conservation problems and pollution problems um, that the ocean is facing, but I keep getting invited on expeditions and I can't say no. So, um, and actually I have written a few proposals even to, to um, for NOAA expeditions. So I can't give it up. I just keep going. So the colossal squid is a possibility. We look forward to hearing about that. Um, Kimo uh, says, your, your work has revealed so much about animal behavior that just couldn't be addressed by traditional net toes. What new questions are you most interested in regarding the behavior of deep sea animals? Oh, well, there's so many animals that have these very strange light organs that you just gotta think, what the heck are they doing? So one of the ones I describe in the book is a gulper eel. You know, it, it's this really long fish with this pelican-like mouth. And at, at the end of its tail, it's got a light organ. So what's it doing with the tail light? Is it doing yoga and dangling that light in front of its mouth? And then it, there's this racing stripe down the side. And um, we captured one of these fish one time with the Johnson Sea Link submersible. And normally, you know, if you bring them up in the net, they're a mess because they've been thrashed by the net and their jaws are broken or whatever. But we brought this up alive into the lab and it I was in a lab, ship lab under fluorescent lights. And I went 
to lift this fish out of the, the capture device that we caught it in. And as I did, that racing stripe down the side lit up so bright that everybody in the room gasped. It had to be the brightest bioluminescence I've ever seen, ever. And I mean, it's a defense, clearly, and probably it used to blind a predator, but still, I mean, I wanna know more about the gulper eel and how it uses its very unusual forms of bioluminescence. Oh, those are bizarre fish, yes. Um, someone anonymous wants to know, where did you get your PhD? I got my PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Oh, I don't know that I knew that, okay. I was in a laboratory of Jim Case, who was, uh, um, and on, also on my committee was Beatrice Sweeney. They were both kind of superstars in the field of bioluminescence. So I was very lucky. Where'd you do your undergrad? Tufts. Kimo's writing, go Gauchos. My friend Kimo went there too. <laughs> um, Lee wants to know what other species besides Atola have been found to have the burglar alarm by luminescence? Actually, we think an awful lot of these fish do, you know, uh, things like the, the viper fish um, that I talked about that they have all these different light organs. They'll flash everything they've got um, if, if they're caught in the clutches of a predator. So I've seen that with uh, a black dragonfish that we caught once with the Johnson Sea Link and brought it up in the lab and everything on this fish lit up. It was just absolutely spectacular. The belly lights, the mucus layer, the fins, the light organs under the eyes, the chin barbel that would normally be used as a lure, but they were all flashing in synchrony and it was a burglar alarm. Get this scientist away from me. <laughs> okay, Kelvin um, asked, did I understand the production of light luminescence is the largest use of metabolic energy in sea life. Oh, no, I can't say that at all. Um, no, that's not what I meant. I just meant I know that it takes a lot of energy to produce light. And so energy is not wasted. It, it's always used um, conservatively. And so the, all that light that I was seeing on that first dive just seemed mystifying to me. Now, part of the mystery was solved because I didn't realize it at the time, but I was stimulating a lot of that luminescence because I was in a suit that was on a tether that was bouncing up and down. And so I was bumping into all these creatures and causing them to flash. Later, when I dove the single person submersible deep rover that is untethered, I took it down to depth and I trimmed it out to neutral buoyancy. And I was gonna sit there in the dark and count the numbers of flashes per minute to see what the spontaneous levels of bioluminescence were. And there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And yet when I bump the thrusters, I get just these rivers of explosions, eruptions of light coming out of the thrusters. I was surrounded by light, but not unless I moved. So that means that it's a bioluminescent minefield down there. And that has a lot to do with how the animals behave and explains, for example, some of these animals that we see from the submersible, instead of running away, they freeze. They don't, they don't run away. Well, freezing is a form of defense if you're living in a minefield. Yeah. Yeah, you, hi you hide. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Alex wants to know, has the deep sea marine canyon off Port Wainumi um, ever been explored? Yeah, um, although not that I know of by submersible, but Jim Childress used to do quite a bit of trawling off of there. Um, it, there there's a, those are pretty rich waters. Okay. Um, Amber asks, are there any bioluminescent creatures that are commonly eaten? I'm uh, <laughs> not common, not commonly anymore, but um, there are stories that the Romans used to eat the um, bioluminescent clams, folas. To know, you know, it didn't, oh, it yeah. didn't, it didn't hurt them. 
um, I think it turned their their urine made their urine glow, but um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, just a few more. Um, Lee wants to know what was your greatest discovery, the discovery of a lifetime? I, I've actually had a few, but, but, but definitely one of the really important ones was um, we discovered a deep sea octopus that had bioluminescent suckers. Or instead of suckers, it had light organs where the suckers would be. And the reason that that ended up on the cover of Nature was because it was a, as an example of evolution caught in the act. Because when, when we looked at those um, light organs, we discovered vestigial um, muscle rings. So they were suckers turning into light organs. And so the, this is um, kind of the hypothesis of how there came to be so much bioluminescence in the deep ocean. As the ocean filled up with nastier and swifter predators that had vision and could see at a distance, prey either had to be able to outswim the predators or find a place to hide. Well, there's no place to hide except to go down dark in, into the dark depths. They've already got eyes. So the selection pressure was to develop more sensitive eyes and enhanced visual signaling. So, you know, if you attracted a mate by raising your, your percula as a fish and had a couple of spots that were attractive, then if those became bioluminescent, that could work even in darkness. Well, this octopus um, is unusual in that it, it doesn't live on the bottom. It lives in the midwater. It has a big web. It looks kind of like an umbrella when, it's, when it spreads itself out. And uh, what an, a lot of octopus do to attract a mate is that uh, they will throw their arms up over their head to display their suckers, um, kind of like a wet t-shirt contest. Look what I've got. Um, <laughs> and and uh, the, the um, octopus moved out into the midwater for whatever reason. <clears throat> and the, the suckers weren't useful for hanging onto anything on the bottom anymore since they were living in midwater but they were useful for this one thing to attract a mate, but only if they could be seen. And so selection drove it from being a, a grasping tool to one that was just a visual tool. And it then uh, also got used for finding food because this octopus has one of the most unusual diets of any cephalopod. It survives almost entirely on a diet of copepods, which would be akin to a, a raccoon in Florida living on a diet of mosquitoes. Sure, there's enough of them, but how do you catch them? So the, the octopus spreads out its arms and twinkles them, looking like a patch of plankton that brings in the copepods and then it closes up its umbrella and pulls the copepods down towards its mouth where it's got a mucus layer that they get embedded in. And then it just munches it like a tasty little aspic. What's the name of that octopus again? Starotuthus sirtensis. It's now called the glowing sucker octopus. And how big? It, how big is it? It's about the size of a football. Oh, wow. Okay. Amazing. Um, Tom wants to know, have you ever come across any plastic in the deep? Oh, sadly, yes. Yes. Um, off, sometimes with stuff living on it. Um, mm. In fact, that's how it ends up sinking is because stuff grows on it and makes it heavy enough so that it, it will sink. Um, Zoe asks, were you saying man submersibles will become more accessible in the future? I'd love to actually explore the deep sea in person, but it seems like ROVs are much, much more common. ROVs are more, more common, but uh, submersibles are um, becoming uh, a lot more accessible. Um, it is right now mostly millionaires that have them, but they are becoming more prevalent. Um, and uh, I, I think that it's going to happen pretty soon. Okay, and that kind of ties in just to two more questions, and we'll um, um, end with the last one, the third question. So, um, uh, Taijar asked. Do you folks take enthusiasts on your expeditions? If not, what would you suggest 
to go on one of these trips? I'm always having people offering to carry my bags for me, but unfortunately there's just the competition for space on these ships is extreme. Um, and so uh, you have to either become a scientist or a technician um, that is you know, servicing the submersibles or um, involved in the science in some way. But even then, it's usually the scientists that get the dives. Or you can become a submersible pilot. That's one way. <laughs> Yeah. How do you become a submersible pilot? Do you get an engineer? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know one engineer um, that that's, has become a submersible pilot. That's a little unusual. Um, uh, another that got trained in the Navy um, mm -hmm. and was a technical diver and then became a submersible um, pilot. Um, it, uh, they they all have different stories. They, they just kind of started hanging around where submersibles were being used or built and that got themselves in the door somehow. Um, so a follow-up kind of like on this topic, Evie, Evie asked, what, what would the consequences of underwater deep sea tourism be? Well, normally you'd worry about that as, and, and of course, you should still worry about it because um, as I said, it could lead to exploitation, but the thing is we're already exploiting the ocean pretty horribly. And so I feel like, I'm not sure we can make it that much worse. I think if people were going down there and appreciating it, they'd be working harder to protect it. That may be naive. I mean, humans can find just remarkable ways to be destructive, um, but, um, yeah, I, I, we, there would have to be protections. You can't have people going down and harvesting deep sea corals, for example. Um, that that would be one of the the ways that it could go very, very wrong. Okay. Um, and the last question, we'll we'll finish up with this last one. Um, Marie wants to know what is the largest ocean creature in your p opinion, and do we know? Well, blue whales are, are considered the largest, definitely. Um, but of course, it depends also on how you define large. If you just want to talk about length, siphonophores can be longer than a blue whale. Um, but yeah, I think we would have to say blue whales. OK. OK, well, um, I'd like to thank, thank you again. Um, thank you to our speaker, Dr. Edie Witter. Thanks again to uh, the Friends of Kabroom and Aquarium and the City of Los Angeles for their support. Um, we apologize if we haven't been able to answer all your questions. Um, once again, our upcoming online lecture is Friday, October 1st, 2021. Dr. Giannis Papastamatiu from Florida International University. And he will be talking about his research on the ecology, biology, and behavior of sharks, rays, and predatory bony fish. And then after that, the next one, hopefully in person, will be on Friday, December 3rd. More information can be found on the Kabroom and Aquarium website. And a reminder, we have recorded this lecture and we will post it on our website soon. Thank you again for joining us. Stay safe. Hope to see you next time and good night.